As Jesus and his disciples traveled throughout Israel, healing and teaching people, they sometimes went through towns that lined a large body of water called the Sea of Galilee. Crowds would gather near the water to hear Jesus speak. One time it was so crowded that Jesus climbed out into a boat in the water and facing the crowd on the shore taught them about what God's kingdom was like. At the end of the day, Jesus told his disciples he wanted to travel to the other side of the lake. So the disciples got into the boat with Jesus and other boats that were with them, and they began to sail across the water. Jesus went to the stern of the boat, laid down on a cushion, and fell asleep. As they sailed, a furious storm rose up, creating waves so large they broke over the boat. Quickly, the water began to fill the boat until it was nearly swamped. As the storm raged, Jesus stayed sleeping in the stern of the boat. The disciples woke him in a panic. Teacher, don't you care if we drown? They asked him. Jesus stood up and yelled at the wind and the waves. Quiet, be still. In that moment, the wind died down and the sea became completely calm. Jesus then turned back to his disciples. Why are you so afraid, he asked. Do you still have no faith? Because of all of this, the disciples were terrified. They asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Good morning, New Hope Community Church. How are you all this morning? Are we bright-eyed and bushy-tailed? No, one or two of you are. The bright-eyed and bushy-tailed group's probably on their motorcycles on their way out of town right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the rest of us will be here nodding off, I suppose. Hey, um, I want to give you an update on Pastor Tim and the crew. Um, in fact, I'll just read you the text message that uh, Pastor Tim sent to me this morning, my time. I don't know what time it was there, but he said that he preached in Inya village, they baptized 12, they burned a family's fetishes, all in a half day's work, God is awesome. Is he not? Yeah. That song we just sang, um, Open the Eyes of My Heart, uh, that's a dangerous prayer. I don't know if you're aware of that. Somebody said that if you're doing, um, if you're bored in the Christian life, then you're doing it wrong. And when I started praying a while back this prayer, God, break my heart for the things that break yours. Open the eyes of my heart. Show me how to see people, God, the way that you do. Um, that can be a dangerous prayer because when you pray for something like that, God will do it, and then your life changes as a result of it. Um, it's blown my life away. If you um, are so inclined and you have an adventurous spirit or you just think God is moving you that direction, I encourage you to continue singing that song in your heart and praying that prayer for yourself, your relationship with God, that he would He would. Break your heart for the things that break his. And then strap your boots on because it's going to be a wild ride. All right. Um, what else is going on? Oh, uh, Tim's not here, so we have um, a resident preacher, of course. Uh, Pastor Gil Hernandez, a good friend of mine. Someday I'll tell you about the time we slept together. Um, <laughs> actually, I'm going to tell you right now because it's a great story. Um, we were in uh, Mexico together. We were scouting a youth mission trip, and me being the penny pincher that I am, I only got us four men one room. And uh, so Gil quickly and promptly uh, secured his bed by placing his bag on a bed, and then he moved on into the shower. And uh, I said, well, I'm going to show him. I'll just climb into bed while he's in the shower. And so I climbed into bed. He got in, of course, on top of the sheets. I was under the sheets. <laughs> and uh, I thought I was going to push it a little farther, and I said, Hey, Gil, um, forgive me because I've been married a long time now, and if I, if I try to cuddle you in our sleep, it's really not my fault. And without missing a beat, this guy is sharp as a tack. He says, you'll have to forgive me also because I've been a cop for a while now, and if I shoot you in your sleep, it won't be my fault. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So you're in for a treat with Pastor Gil. He's our uh, missions pastor here 
at New Hope and uh, everywhere we go, everywhere we go, when we travel together, everything relates to a verse to him. It, it comes up in every third uh, sentence in our conversation. Oh, that reminds me of a verse. Oh, the scripture says this. And uh, so we're going to be very blessed to hear from Gil today. Um, at this point, I'm going to invite uh, Nick Delgado to come up and give us a little update on the young marrieds. Well, and just to let you know that if I ever go on a mission trip with either one of you, I'm not staying in either one of your rooms. <laughs> I have my own gun. I have my own wife. I'm covered. <laughs> Real quick, I just want to update you. Inside your program, you'll see the information, so I'll keep it short. But next Sunday, I'm going to be hosting uh, just a time of, of refreshments and food, as well as uh, get to know and some information for the young families, young married ministries. You're not obligating yourself to anything, but you'll get a chance to, for you to meet uh, and get to know myself and my wife more personally. You can see my kids too. But uh, again, I just want to share with you vision and my heart on what I see God doing with young marriages and young families based on my experience over the years and how I can serve the, the church here at New Hope. But also I want to hear from your heart and your ideas of what you would like to see happen with the young families and the young marriages here at New Hope. And then the other information that is in your program is the parking posse. You want more information about that? Just indicate the information that it requests, and I'll get back to you that as well. Here you go, Pastor. All right. Thank you, Nick. All right. So if it's your first time here today, um, I'm going to bug you for just a moment. There are some cards in front of you in the pews in front of you that look like this. There's a pink side and a green side. Uh, the green side are just communication from you guys to the office. If you want to let us know if a, of a prayer request or uh, there's a need in the church, uh, there could be a number of things that you'd like to communicate to us, uh, your address change, those kinds of things. That's the green side. Uh, for the visitors, though, the pink side, uh, we'd like to welcome you to New Hope. And the traditional way that we do that, because we don't want to single you out or, or bother you too much, um, if you would just be willing to fill that out, stick it in the offering basket, and uh, we promise we won't bother you on the phone or beat on your door. But through the mail, we'd like to send you some information about New Hope Community Church. And then, if you choose to be bothered by us, you can contact us, and we'd be happy to take you to lunch or coffee or something like that. But we'd like to get to know you, so please allow us to do that. Um, other things. Okay, so I've told you about the bike ride. Uh, apparently, it's of no consequence now, but the, the deal was if it didn't rain, they're going to go. And so they went. Women's retreat, there's still a last... Uh, chance effort if you would like to be on that women's retreat there's a couple of tickets left there are uh, there's a pink sheet on these clipboards that I'm going to send around and also the white sheet on top is um, the Easter choir Easter choir so if you'd like to be a part of that Easter choir if you can carry a tune in a bucket um, show up and then Randy will either allow you or not I don't know he some of it costs money I don't know there's a tax or something no uh, he wants I'm sure everybody who's willing um, I might join it if I can convince my daughter. You put me in the back, way back. All right. Um, Mexico, uh, in your bulletins, it says that there's a Mexico meeting today. There is not a Mexico meeting today. Um, that is next week. I got in touch with Brittany this morning, and she told me that there is no Mexico meeting today. That begins next week for those of you who are going on the short-term mission trip to Mexico. Also, uh, Sunday school teachers and lay uh, youth workers here in the church, um, it's time to get live scanned again. It was about five years ago when we all got live scanned. And uh, if you don't know what that is, that's where some folks from uh, the city come out and they fingerprint us and they background check us and make sure that, you know, we haven't stolen any kids lately. Um, and so that we're cleared to go ahead and teach Sunday school and those kinds of things. So it's uh, every five years, it's just time to do that again because, you know, we don't know what you're out there doing. No, I, I have every confidence. Just for just for posterity, right? The scripture says to be above reproach. Um, I think that's it, unless there's anything else that you guys want to bring forward. All right, then, at this time, I'd like to invite our ushers to come forward as we prepare to receive our morning tithes and offerings. Would you pray with me? Father, we understand that, um, that you're holy that you're righteous. And it's apparent to me that, that I'm not, that we're not. In fact, your scripture reminds us of that. And that's what makes me remember that, um, 
that we're in desperate need of you, God. We put on a good show. We put on a good show of um, acting like we have it all together, but the truth is, Jesus, we so desperately need you. We can't even be righteous without you, God. So I thank you that um, those who have come here this morning have not come in vain. They sit next to brothers and sisters who contain a love this world cannot offer because it is your holy love. Lord, as we, uh, as we praise you and as we hear your word, I pray that your Holy Spirit, God, would just touch our hearts today, that, God, we would be overwhelmed with your presence, that, Jesus, um, you would teach us something new and maybe terrifying today as we walk out and realize that our lives will be changed forevermore. You speak to us about peace today. And I have a sneaking suspicion that so many of us are missing that. Maybe we've been Christians for a long time, God. And somewhere that peace that passes understanding became lost to us. And Lord, maybe we have never known you. And this peace is something that it seems inviting. Lord, just touch us today. As we give, Lord, we pray that we do it with a grateful heart and that, Jesus, you would use the resources that filter through this church for your glory and your honor. Because you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and this life does not make sense without you. We love you, Jesus, and say it in your name. Amen. You're not telling tales out of school. Look in your Bibles for Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. Galatians 5, 22. Our subject this past few weeks has been the following. Love, joy, and today we have peace. If you wonder where we've gotten these titles, they come from the Believe Book, the Bible. And we're in the process now of going through the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, and I'll read them, I'll read the verses there. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such, there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature, its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. The fruit of the Spirit. Let's see. I've got notes. I've got my iPad with the same notes. But my notes on paper are much larger than what I have on my iPad, so I'll probably just set that to one side. <clears throat> in 1957, what time do we end here? 10.15 or 10.30? Or, or 9.30? No, 9.45 now. I, I just realized this, and this is what my illustration is going to be about, the clock. In 1957, I was in the U.S. Army. I had been drafted, fresh out of school. And I was in uh, Fort Carson, Colorado during the last... Uh, few months of my two-year hitch with the U.S. Army, and I was asked to speak one Sunday morning at uh, Southside Bible Chapel in Colorado Springs, and all the elders had agreed that uh, I would speak, and I said, fine, I'd be glad to do it. Well, on the pulpit, they had a handwritten, hand-painted sign, I should say, that said, preach the word, preach the word. Don't preach anything else. Don't talk about anything else, but preach the Word. And they had a clock there. And that's what's making me try and figure out what time we finish at 10.30 at least. You'll, you'll get out of here before that. I guarantee you that. But preach the Word. And that's what we're going to attempt to do this morning. And this morning our subject, our topic is peace. Peace. And we've been singing about peace. In our book on page 355... If you want to look at it, 
I don't want to have you bring your book and not use it. Uh, 355 is the chapter that we're looking at today, chapter 23. And we have the key verse. That's what I want to read first. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> the key verse says on page 355, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Peace. The peace of God. That's what we will be talking about this morning. The peace of God. Charles Wesley wrote many, many years ago, I rest beneath the Almighty's shade. My griefs expire. My troubles cease. Thou, Lord, on whom my soul is stayed, wilt keep me still in perfect peace. Those were his thoughts about peace back then. Then there was another man who wrote, and his name was Edward J. Hickerstedt. He was born in 1825 and died in 1906. Wrote the following, and I'm only going to read part of what he wrote. You'll get the rest of the story at the end of the sermon. But I just want to whet your appetites right now with the following. Peace, perfect peace, in this dark world of sin? Peace, perfect peace, by thronging duties pressed? Peace, perfect peace, with sorrow surging round? Peace, perfect peace, with loved ones far away? Peace, perfect peace, our future all unknown? Stay tuned for the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say. I grew up in Chicago, born in Gary, Indiana, not too far from Chicago, and um, always listened to Paul Harvey, always enjoyed him. He's a Christian, went to a local church there in Chicago, and I really enjoyed him very, very much. And I was glad to come out here and still hear him until the Lord took him home. Peace, our subject today. People have expressed their thoughts about peace. Charles Wesley, and up to a point, Edward Hickerstedt. A world in turmoil, a world in disorder. There was an article written in one of the periodicals at the Moody Bible Institute in the city of Chicago. If you know where that is, you'll probably re recognize the address, 820 North LaSalle, right near Chicago Avenue, crossroads. And in this journal, someone wrote the following, and this was in June 1988. In its study, the periodical discovered that of 3,530 years of recorded history, only 286 years have seen peace. Imagine that. 3,530 years of recorded history, only 286 years have seen peace. The Bible talks about peace. The Bible tells us how we can acquire peace, but there's a lot of people who don't know or aren't concerned about reading it in the Word of God. And moreover, there have been over 8,000 treaties that have been made and all broken. What's wrong with us? What happens to us? Why does God have to remind us about peace? What is it that we don't have? Well, why we don't have peace is because there's discord, anguish, conflict, disharmony, disorder, crimes in the world. And the and the answer to this question is very simple. Why do we have all of this? Well, it's because of a three-letter word. And I am in the middle. S-I-N. Because of sin. Because man from the very beginning chose to disobey God instead of obeying God and doing what he wanted. Because of sin, 
there's little peace in the world. The Bible clearly shows us that sin is rebellion against God. And that's exactly what occurred back in the Old Testament in the book of Genesis. Rebellion against God. God never intended for man to sin. He gave man a free will to choose his own course in life. When God placed Adam and Eve on this earth, there was no sin on earth yet. It was perfect. God put man in a perfect environment called the Garden of Eden. And we ask today, why can't we have enjoyed that from the very beginning of our life? In the garden, there was peace. Peace as, as it has been unknown since here on earth. There was no death, no conflict between living things. Animals did not eat one another. It was just plain, wonderful peace. The kind of peace that we sang about uh, this morning here. The moment that Adam and Eve rebelled against God, they lost their state of peace. In that moment, they became afraid. We read in the book of Genesis, and we'll read that uh, perhaps in a little while. <clears throat> they became aware of their nakedness and made leaves to cover themselves. Do you see what happened? There was perfect harmony with God, with each other, and all around them was at peace until they sinned. And they started to do things because they were now aware that they were naked. They started to do, to do things that would cover up their nakedness. So they went probably to the tree with the biggest leaves, the largest, greatest, biggest, and cut them and covered themselves. But what happens uh, uh, with the leaf when you cut it from the tree? It dries. Com it commences to dry. And as it dries... It withers. As it withers, it gets, you can just make flakes out of it. So it didn't very, last very long. So God said, I have to do something to cover these people. And what God had done was he had taken skins from an animal. How do you take skins from an animal without killing them? Shedding blood. So God starts from the very beginning to give us a picture of the bloodline in the Bible. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission, the Bible says. And that blood that was shed when the animals gave up their skins was an idea, was a thought of what was going to happen later on in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. As they become aware of their nakedness, God has to do something for them. Before they were in perfect harmony with God, with each other, and everything else was at peace, like I said, until they sinned. But now they were in pe at peace no longer. Now there was conflict. So God says, I will cover their sin by shedding blood. And that picture has come all the way through the Bible down to us. They, Adam and Eve, not God, caused the conflict with their creator. Their sin not only affected themselves, but it affected the whole world and even all the universe. If we stopped here this morning, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> There would be no point to the message, no hope. Yet in Genesis chapter 3, and now we'll go to Genesis chapter 3 if you'd like. I want to read a few verses there. First book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 3, if you brought your Bibles with you. Genesis chapter 3, verses 6 to 24, I'll read a few of them. Just to show you where we got this uh, incident, this illustration, this story. Genesis chapter 3. Verse 6. And it starts as follows. And I brought my NIV Bible. I don't know why. I always read from my King James. My King James has larger print, and this is very small print. So if I make a mistake now and again, I have to dry my eyes because I've gone to seven specialists, eye specialists, and haven't been able to cure my problem in all these many, many years that I've gone to them. So I pull out my hanky constantly. Verse 3, as soon as I find it. Okay. Uh, well, let's start at one. There's no, no missing there. Uh, now, <clears throat> the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree of the garden? 
The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the, of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate. She also gave some <coughs> excuse me, to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord, of the Lord God, as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, in the cool of the day. Uh, have you heard what the temperature is in uh, Africa today? Okay, somebody reported next door, I think it was Gene uh, Sperling, said that the temperature there in Africa, where our team from New Hope happens to be, is between 120 and 125 degrees. So that's hot. And uh, I'm sure glad I'm here with you all today. <laughs> It's kind of nice. <clears throat> in fact, let me tell you a little bit more. Uh, I spent 21 years in Mexico uh, in mission work. And the place where we ended up in July, when it's around 100 degree here, high is 80 there in Mexico, where we are. People complain about the heat at 80 degrees. And it's dry. It's not humid. Up in the mountains, 5,500 feet in elevation. Tehuacan, Puebla is the name of it, in case you're familiar with Mexico. And it's very nice up there. In fact, that's where my wife is from. That's where I met her. She was our next door neighbor. My first wife passed away in 2007. Some of you knew her. And um, the Lord opened up the, the way to keep going back to Tehuacan, even after we left Mexico. <clears throat> and I've been going back every January, and guess what other month I go back to Mexico? July. <laughs> July, during the hottest part of the month. And while I went down, I was uh, helping uh, uh, Jim Cece of uh, Jaron Bible Institute interpreting for him and the group. <coughs> That's when Angelina, my wife, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> she and I started to talk to one another. She and her husband were our next-door neighbors. He was a very good friend of mine, and my wife was a very good friend of hers. And they spent, and we spent a lot of time together. In fact, I'll tell you the story. I didn't tell the other folks this part of the story. But um, when her first child was going to be born, her husband was on the road and contacted his wife, and she said, I may have the child today. And uh, he said, I don't think I'll make it home. I'll try, but I don't think I'll make it home. But if I don't get home... Go next door and ask Gil and Thelma if they won't help take you to the clinic. And she came over and we said, sure, we'll take you to the clinic. Well, <clears throat> the time came for her to deliver her first child. And uh, she came over and said, he's not going to make it. Would you take me to the clinic? So we took her to the clinic and her first child was born. My wife and I are both standing there in the waiting room. The nurse comes out with a baby hands it to me and says, congratulations, it's a girl. My <laughs> wife stood up quickly and said, he's not the father. <laughs> he's not the father. Well, now that we're married, she's my stepdaughter. <laughs> so we still see one another, and it's, it's still a very friendly, friendly terms, and I thank the Lord uh, for Angelina. July, I'm gone. In fact, we didn't come back until August one year. We just enjoyed it so much. But getting back to the Word, this is more important than what I have to tell you <clears throat> about myself. 
I think I left, I'll read the first part of verse 8 again. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called out to the man, where are you? This is God's first question in the Bible. Where are you? God looking for fallen man. God looking for the sinner. We had another question a little prior to this one. Satan is talking, so God has said, eh? But now God is looking for the sinner. And you know, the first question in the uh, New Testament just comes to mind. The first question is the New Testament is a sinner looking for God, the wise men. Where is he that is born king of the Jews? And it's interesting uh, to, to read the first question on the part of both. He answered, God answered, or uh, I'm sorry, uh, Adam. Adam, I couldn't even remember his name. He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid. That moment of joy, that moment of bliss, that time that he could spend there just as happy as could be, has now turned into fear. And I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Not my fault, said Adam, it's the woman's fault. The woman says, not my fault, it's the serpent's fault. Nobody wants to take the blame, but they've lost their peace. They are now afraid, and they're naked. <clears throat> so the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life, and I will pour, no, excuse me, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. Now, this is a prophecy about the Lord Jesus Christ. You will strike his heel. But the important part is he will crush your head in that same verse. Peace. Peace was lost in the garden because of sin. (coughs) Excuse me. (coughs) There was once a king who offered a prize to the artist who would paint the best picture of peace. Many artists tried and painted. The king looked at all the pictures, but there was only two he really liked, and he had to choose between them. One picture was of a calm lake. The lake was a perfect mirror for a peaceful towering mountains all around it. Overhead was a blue sky with fluffy white clouds. All who saw the picture thought it was a picture of perfect peace. The other picture had mountains too, but these were rugged and bare. Above was an angry sky from which rain fell and lightning was playing up there in the sky. Down the side of the mountain tumbled a foaming waterfall. This did not look like peace at all. But when the king looked closely, he saw behind the waterfall a tiny bush growing in a crack in the rock. In the bush was a mo- where a mother, in the bush a mother bird had built her nest. There in the midst of the rush of angry water sat the mother. Oh, thank you, brother. That's just what I needed. I don't know why I didn't bring any. I didn't know where to put a cup, a styrofoam cup. And I thank you again. In the bush, a mother had built a nest. And her little bird was in the nest. King looked at it. He saw perfect peace. And which picture do you think he chose? The first one or the second one? Well, I'll tell you the second one. Because, explained the king... Peace does not mean 
to be in a place where there is no noise, no trouble, or hard work. Peace means to be in the midst of all things and still be calm in your heart. That is the real meaning of peace. So the second picture actually won. Some have described peace as the following. The absence of war and hostility. An agreement or a treaty to end hostilities. Freedom from quarrels and disagreement. Public security and order. I don't know how many of you know it, but last night there was a uh, shooting at Fashion Fair Mall. Injured? Arrested? I don't know the outcome. Just listen to my scanner. I still have one at home <laughs> to see what's going on, especially when I hear sirens going by near the house. And inner contentment, serenity, peace of mind. Because there was public security and order, I didn't have to go out and worry about it. It just happened that the grandson was over at the mall, and he came home running, 21 years old. He ran home. He said, I saw all of this, and he says, I'm going. I'm going home. So he arrived there at home. That's how peace is described by some. The Old Testament anticipated peace, the Lord Jesus, and the New Testament confirmed that peace and the Lord Jesus Christ as well. Confirmed that God's peace would be mediated through a Messiah. And for this, I'd like to take you to Isaiah chapter 9. <clears throat> Isaías capítulo 9. That's just a sign for my wife so she can know where I am. Isaiah chapter 9. And we read the following in Isaiah chapter 9. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles. And we saw Jesus on the water here and on, on, on the Sea of Galilee a little while ago, being painted, of course. By the way of the sea along the Jordan. <clears throat> Excuse me. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of the shadow of death. A light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. Excuse me. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when the dividing, when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke. Excuse me again. I, I'm still having problems here. <clears throat> the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressors, every warrior's boot used in battle, and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. Now this is the part I wanted to get to, verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a child is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and listen to this title, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Now we're carried to the coming of the Messiah. The Messiah is coming. The northern territory of Israel, as we read some of those names there, which had been brought into contempt by the invaders, someday will be made glorious. Galilee of the Gentiles was the Savior's boyhood home. He spent a lot of time there. And it was part of the scene of his public ministry. But now we read about Christ's birth, which brought light to Galilee. The first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ describes the coming of the Savior. The first clause, as we read verse 6 there, for unto us a child is born. And the second a clause of that same verse, and I'm, I'm going to be speaking on that. To us a son is given, 
to one, a child is born, and the other clause is a son is given. <clears throat> the child was born, the son was given. Note, the son was not born. It was a child. Why? Why does it say it this way? It says it this way because of one thing. In the beginning, God said, let us make man in our own image. Let us. Who are the us? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ as Son has lived in eternity past. There was no beginning with Him, nor with the Holy Spirit, nor with God the Father. So what we have now, the Son was not born, He was given. For as God, He was from everlasting, but as man He was born. And yet, as man He was born, He was God when at his birth, as much as on the transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17, when the scriptures describe that his face shone like a bright light, and Jesus Christ is the one that the scriptures talk about <clears throat> as the Son was given. And later on it talks about that the government will be upon his shoulder, he will reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. The rest of the verse describes his personal glories. His name, be called Wonderful Counselor. This name talks about his infinite wisdom. Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, the omnipotent supreme ruler. He is infinite in power. Everlasting Father or the Father of Eternity. That's the name of Jesus. Eternal himself, he confers e eternal life <clears throat> on those who believe in him. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> infinite in love. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is infinite in love. Prince of Peace, the one who will at last bring peace to this troubled world. Infinite in redemption. The babe as he lay <clears throat> excuse me, in the manger was a divine glory, as I said, as fully as he was in Matthew chapter 17. Peace with God came through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. For as we read in Romans 5.1, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. How is this so? Well, let's find out. Let's read Isaiah 53, which is another portion of the book. Uh, of the Believe series, but uh, we'll read it in the King James here. Well, NIV, I'm sorry. 53, verse 1. It says, Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of a dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with sufferings, like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And who can speak of the descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had come Though, excuse me, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, 
he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And he, excuse me, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hands. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. A question in the New Testament asks, of who is he speaking about? Well, he's speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ and him only. The report of the death of the servant will give Israel an opportunity to realize who he is. The Jewish remnant that we read about in verse uh, 1 <clears throat> will lament the fact that so few people will believe their message about the servant and that so few will acknowledge their message is coming from God and his strength, consequently, the saving power of the Lord was not revealed to many either. <clears throat> he grew up. We read a little while ago. He grew before God as a tender shoot before the delighted gaze of God. When God saw Jesus Christ as a child, he saw him in perfection. He saw him on the cross as perfection as well, as the one who was taking our sins upon himself. In his appearance, as we have just read in chapter 53 here of the book of Isaiah, he did not look like a royal person. There was no beauty, no majesty. The nation of Israel could not see anything that would attract them to him. The nation of Israel despised and rejected the servant who experienced sorrow, grief, anguish, and suffering. He was the kind of individual people do not normally want to look at. What was it about Jesus that the people did not want to see? What was it about the Lord Jesus that people turned their faces around? They were repulsed by him. For these reasons, the scriptures say, they did not esteem him. They did not think he was important. Yet he was and is the most important person in the world, for he is the servant of God, the servant of the Lord. Though not realizing it at the time, someday the nation will realize this, will understand, will take this in and say, fine, I understand. <clears throat> His taking our infirmities and our sins speaks of the consequences of sins. He bore our sins. He carried our transgressions. Israel now knows. In John chapter 1, verse 12, it tells us, He came unto His own, to Israel. He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. But as, many as it, but as many as received Him, to them gave He the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe in His name. So now they're getting to the point where they can understand a little, bit, a little better of who He is. The cross. When the Jews were looking and watching Jesus being crucified. They looked at, upon him and they couldn't figure it out. They couldn't understand what the Old Testament was talking about, how it describes him so perfectly, all of his torture, all of his, and we'll talk about that in just a moment, all that he felt. They couldn't figure out why the Lord Jesus Christ would do that. <clears throat> There's a few words that describe what went on. And when I saw, and I think most of you, if, if not some of you, saw the passion of the Christ. Uh, I'm seeing a few heads say yes. Okay, good. I had read the scriptures for many, many years and had read Isaiah 53, the description. But it wasn't until I saw the picture, the passion of the Christ, that it portrayed so vividly the death, the sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ first and the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, that I actually entered into the fullness of what he had done for me. I saw him. I didn't see him. I saw the actor. I saw the actor being portrayed as Jesus and how they had harmed him and what all they had done. We read <clears throat> in this chapter about transgressions, iniquities, wickedness, and sin, 
And those are the things that took our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to the cross. The servant vicariously took on himself all the sins and sp <clears throat> of the nation <clears throat> and carried them on himself. He was stricken, smitten, afflicted, according to Isaiah 53, 7. And the people looked upon him and they said, because he blasphemed God, he said that he was, he and the Father were one, he said. They were taking that as blasphemy and they said he's actually dying because of that. He's actually bearing the judgment of blasphemy. It's been pointed out uh, by medical science that there are five kinds of wounds known to man. And Jesus Christ suffered all five of these wounds. Contusion, blows by a rod, bruises, discoloration. Laceration, scourging, cutting and slashing. Penetrating wounds, the crown of thorns they place on his head and hit down with a reed. Perforating wounds, the nails that went through his hand. Incised wounds, the spear that they put into his side, sort of like carving on his side. Ironically, his wounds inflicted by the soldier scourging, which were followed by his death, are the means of healing the believer's spiritual wounds today. Because of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us, he's given us salvation, he's healed us, and has given us. But why did he do it? Well, Paul talks about it later on in Philippians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, <clears throat> and on. And I have it written here, and being found in human form, talking about Jesus, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. His death satisfied the wrath of God against sin and allows him to forgive the sins of the nation and of others who believe as well, because they have been paid for by the servant's substitutionary death. Major Ian Thomas, <clears throat> who has occupied this pulpit several years ago and for weeks at a time, put it this way in his book, The Saving Life of Christ, and I'll read what he says. The Lord Jesus knew that the Father had given all things into his hands, that as man all the illimitable sources of deity had been vested in his person. That is the first thing I would like you to notice, Major Thomas says, for although he was in the beginning with God and was God and is God, and although as the creative word all things were made by him, when he came to this earth in the very fullest sense of the term, he became man. But he became man as God intended man to be. And behaved as God intended man to behave, walking day by day in that relationship with the Father, which God had always intended should exist between you, man, and God himself. That's what God desires of us, so says Major Ian Thomas. Back in chapter 9, verse... Uh, uh, of Isaiah, the Lord promised them a redeemer. Isaiah continued the theme of light and darkness by announcing the, there will be no more gloom. The redeemer will come and bring to the world the dawning of a new day. We know that this prophecy refers to the Lord Jesus Christ because on the way it's quoted, uh, no, because of the way it is quoted in Matthew chapter 4. Peace. Perfect peace in this dark world of sin. But there was a question. There will not be peace in the world until all nations are reconciled to God. There will not be national peace without there being civil peace. There will not be civil peace until there is personal peace in each person's life. 
There will not be personal peace until each person has trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as their own personal Savior. Then, as you and I do what God wants us to do, we will have the peace that passeth understanding. The key idea of the book on page 355, once again, I'm going to read from that. I am free from anxiety because I have found peace with God, peace with others. But notice this. Notably, it says, and peace with myself. A lot of people today have problems with themselves. They have not accepted their role in life as God has given them. What they want to do is live a life that's pleasing to themselves. But God wants us to have a, a peace within us. Now in the next minute or two, the rest of the story. From Paul Harvey, as he would say it. Peace. Perfect peace. In this dark world of sin, the blood of Jesus whispers peace within. Peace. Perfect peace. By thronging duties pressed, to do the will of Jesus, this is rest. Peace, perfect peace, with sorrow surging round, on Jesus' bosom, naught but calm is found. Peace, perfect peace, with loved ones far away, <clears throat> in Jesus' keeping, we are safe and they. Peace, Perfect peace. Our future all unknown? Jesus we know, and he is on the throne. And we're so grateful to him for being on the, tr on the throne. And we're so thankful to God that we can enjoy a peace that passeth understanding and enjoy the fruit of the Spirit. Learn to appreciate the fruit of the Spirit Grow in the fruit of the Spirit. Allow the fruit of the Spirit to take your life, to take your life in such a way that it will change us. And as it changes us, people will say, why are you so different? It's because the Lord Jesus Christ lives within us. And thank God that we heard the word at one time in our life that caused us to say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ and to accept the salvation that he, that he offered us. Let's pray. Our loving God and Father, how grateful we are that although we can talk about peace today, we can have inner peace with our, within ourselves. And this peace comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. My peace I leave you. He said as he was parting. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity that you've given us in our lifetime to read your word, to hear about the peace that you give to your own. We trust, Father, your blessing upon each and every one of us. We pray once again for the team there in Africa and ask, Father, that you will give them help. It's later on in the evening now for them. And as they get ready to wrap up the day, we pray, Father, that their day may have been blessed by you and that they are encouraged despite the fact that there's so much heat out there. Thank you for the peace that we can enjoy for the joy of knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, that you sent the very best that you had in heaven to come down into this world to die for us. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. Thank you, Father. Part us now with your blessing. In Jesus' worthy and precious name, amen.